So guys, gals, uh, our goal this week is to finish muscle physiology, start and finish muscle gross anatomy, and start and finish, finish joints. We're going to focus primarily on synovial joints on Friday. Next week, we'll spend three days focusing on the endocrine system. And then we have your third lecture exam two weeks from today. And just as a reminder, that third lecture exam is going to have um, it is going to be a computer-based test. It will be 50 questions. You get 50 minutes. It will be very similar to the last test in that there will be multiple question banks. And a predetermined number of questions will be pulled at random from those multiple question banks based on the topic breakdown that we had in lecture. Let's get going on muscle physiology. There are different classes of muscles in our bodies. These different classes of muscle fibers, I should say, these different classes of muscle fibers can perform differently. And you probably noticed this, like, even when you're in primary school or secondary school, some individuals, you know, have a predisposition for certain kinds of physical activity. Other individuals have a predisposition for those other types of physical activities. Those predispositions that you have are genetically linked to the muscle fiber types you have. We also find that these muscle fiber types vary from muscle group to muscle group within an organism. My favorite analogy is white meat versus dark meat. If you ever go buy chicken, and I love fried chicken, they always ask you, do you want white meat or do you want dark meat? The differences between the white meat and the dark meat are directly correlated to muscle fiber type. So let's talk about the dark meat first, the slow twitch fibers. And when we think of dark meat on the chicken, those are going to be muscles of the legs, those are going to be muscles that need lots of endurance. And those muscles, or slow twitch oxidative fibers, are going to be adapted to have lots of ATP production. Now, if they're going to make lots of ATP, we need the ingredients to make ATP. We need sugar, we need oxygen, and we need mitochondria. And we find that these slow twitch fibers are going to have adaptations to maximize those three ingredients to maximize ATP production. Our slow twitch fibers in particular have lots of myoglobin in them. Myoglobin is a globular protein with one iron atom in the middle. And because of those high concentrations of myoglobin, that iron, and iron, our slow twitch oxidative fibers are going to have a lot of pigmentation to them. They're going to be colored differently from the fast twitch fibers that don't have high concentrations of myoglobin and consequently don't have as much pigmentation, the white meat. So as we're looking at type 1 fibers, they can generate a lot of ATP. And we find that these are going to be primarily found in muscles that are almost continually contracting. If we're looking at a skeletal muscle that's contracting almost all the time, muscles of the legs, muscles of the trunk, particularly the lower back, these muscles are going to be adapted to make lots of ATP and will be slow twitch fibers. As we look at these fibers, they don't necessarily generate a ton of physical force. The primary emphasis of this variation of skeletal muscle fiber is endurance over horsepower. And there's trade-offs. If you increase endurance, you lose horsepower. It's kind of like when you buy a car. You can have lots of fuel efficiency, or you can have lots of excitement. It's hard to have both at the same time. We also have fast twitch fibers. And these type two fibers are the kind that are present in human beings. Human beings will have the slow twitch and will have type 2 fast twitch. These fast twitch fibers are generated, or excuse me, designed to have the maximum response time and the maximum torque. So when we look at these muscles, or these fibers, they're going to be in our power muscles. So when we think of our power muscles, think of the gastrocnemius of the lower leg, the muscle that you use to help jump or stand up on your tippy toes. Um, as we look at this muscle, it's going to, instead of focus on ATP generation, it's going to focus primarily on rapid release of ATP. So we're going to have a 
variation of ATPase, the enzyme in the electron transport chain that synthesizes ATP. And this variation is going to be the fast acting variation. These kinds of muscle fibers also have enlarged sarcoplasmic reticulums. Having an enlarged sarcoplasmic reticulum allows for these type 2 fast twitch fibers to rapidly release calcium ions into the sarcoplasm. Having that rapid release of calcium ions causes the troponin to be concentrated rapidly so that tropomyosin can be pulled out of the way and actin and myosin can initiate the crossbridge cycle quicker rather than slower. Now these fast twitch fibers don't have lots of oxygen stored in them. They don't have lots of mitochondria delivering oxygen. So they wear out really quickly. They can have a lot of ATP in reserve, but they deplete their ATP reserves very quickly. And because they run out of ATP very quickly, they will shift over to anaerobic fermentation. These are the muscles that when you're sprinting, when you're lifting heavy things, and then you start to feel sore really quickly. These are the muscles that get sore super quickly because they're shifting over to that anaerobic respiration and their low, low oxygen environment. Because there is very little myoglobin and very little iron, these are going to be the white muscles or the white muscle tissue, if you're thinking of the fried chicken analogy. So think of the chicken breast, for example. These fibers are designed to have the maximum amount of force and the maximum speed of contraction. And we find that these muscles, because they're just designed for power and not control, will have very large motor units as opposed to those slow twitch oxidative fibers, which have smaller motor units, but will give you finer control and more endurance. Um, a good example of a smaller motor unit in a slow twitch oxidative fiber, um, so think over here, back, to, back a slide to the slow twitch fibers, could be the orbicularis oris, the muscle that goes around your lips. You can contract your lips for a very, very long time, and you have very, very small motor units associated with your lips. Um, and then when we think of these fast twitch fibers, um, classic examples of large muscles would be the gastrocnemius, or you could also have the, the large butt muscle. I'm having such a brain hiccup right now. The gluteus maximus. The type 2A fibers are ones that are, generally speaking, not present in human beings. These are the in-between E fibers. Instead of being super strong or having super high endurance, they have a blending of both. They're fairly fast twitch, and they're also fatigue resistant. We, generally speaking, don't have a lot of these as human beings. Individuals that have a high concentration of these type 2A oxidative fibers or fast twitch fibers are generally speaking going to be individuals that can generate, athletically speaking, lots of force for an extended period of time. Think of um, wrestlers or grapplers or swimmers. It takes a lot of force to push a body through the water, but you have to generate that force for extended periods of time. So, we've thought about these different muscle fiber types. Let's apply this to people. Who would have more mitochondria in their skeletal muscle fibers? So this is an, an application question. We have a 50-year-old computer programmer who's sedentary, a 20-year-old soccer player, a long-term hospice patient, and for those of you who don't know, hospice means that they're on their deathbed, um, a model on a reduced calorie diet, or a brand new baby, a newborn. So who would have the most mitochondria? Another way of rephrasing this question is who would need the most ATP for their muscles? Which lifestyle would require the most ATP. So we're down to about 15 seconds. Make sure you answer if you haven't answered yet. 
The correct answer is the 20-year-old soccer player. They were the odd duck out in the scenario. All the other options were individuals that did not need a lot of ATP, so they would not have a lot of mitochondria. And I'm glad to see that, as a whole, we understand that concept. So let's talk about how we can strengthen and condition our muscles. The, our strength and our physical condition of our muscle will depend on multiple factors. The single most important thing that influences the strength of your muscle is how big the muscle is. Generally speaking, people with bigger muscles have stronger muscles. You know, that's not necessarily rocket science. And as we're looking at these muscle fibers, thick muscles are going to form, not necessarily because they have more muscle cells. When somebody goes to the weight room, they bulk up, they have lots of hypertrophy of the muscle fibers. A common misconception that students have is that they're adding more skeletal muscle cells. That is incorrect. When somebody's bulking up, they take the number of their individual skeletal muscle cells and individual cells get larger, increase in size. So if you look at um, someone that was very thin and then look at them after they bulked up, they don't necessarily have more muscle fibers, but their individual muscle fibers have become larger, and that's how you bulk up as an adult. We're also going to find that the arrangement of the fascicles within the muscle influence the strength of the muscle. And this is one of those situations where I really wish that gross anatomy of muscle presentation had it been corrupted over last weekend. If we had covered gross anatomy of muscles, this would make a lot more sense. Um, so I'm gonna camp on this slide for a little bit longer. Um, the fascicles in a muscle are bundles of muscle fibers. That's a fascicle. And depending on the muscle fiber, sometimes those fascicles are lengthwise with the direction of the muscle. Sometimes we're going to have those fascicles um, meeting in the middle and kind of forming a pattern like a feather. Sometimes those fascicles all start at the same point. They bulge out in the middle and they come back together. There's different ways of orienting muscle cells and fascicles within a muscle. The strongest arrangement of fascicles is the pennate arrangement. And the classic example of a pennate fascicle arrangement is going to be the gastrocnemius. Pound for pound, the gastrocnemius is one of the strongest muscles in our bodies. Something else that's going to influence the strength of a skeletal muscle fiber is the size of your motor units. And I should say active motor units. Let's underline active. That's a key term there. Um, one of my favorite studies that I read on muscle conditioning was performed up in the St. Scholastica up in Duluth oh, about 15, 16 years ago now. And it was a really simple study. The researcher had people come in and they measured the strength of a leg extension on the left leg and the right leg, just to get a baseline. And then they had the, re the test subjects work out their left leg and never work out their right leg. So three times a week, they'd come in and do leg extensions with the left leg. And then after several months of doing this, they measured the strength of the left leg versus the strength of the right leg. And the right leg got stronger, even though they were never working out the right leg. And it all goes back to activating the motor units. As you exercise, the first gains in strength you get. So for those of you who've gone to the weight room, the rule of thumb is that you have to lift weights for about six weeks before you start to get stronger, consistently for six weeks. After six weeks, you don't necessarily start getting bigger muscles, but you notice you get stronger. And that increase in strength comes as you start to activate more motor units. Larger active motor units are going to give you a stronger strength of contraction than smaller motor units or inactive motor units. And then finally, we also have multiple motor unit summation. Within a muscle, if you can activate multiple motor units at the same time in the same muscle, you're going to have a stronger strength of contraction. And there's some give and take. You have some mechanisms in your body that inhibit the strength of the contractions. Um, there's a special structure called the Golgi tendon apparatus in the tendons of your muscles that measures tension on your muscles. And I like to think of it as the kill switch. 
if there's too much tension placed on your muscle, this apparatus turns off the signal. And there's a very good reason for that. If you have too much tension on your muscles, you can tear your muscles away from your bones. That's very painful, and generally speaking, it's not good for you as an individual. So there's this fine line between activating motor units and keeping muscles attached to the bones. You don't want to tear your muscles away from the bone. We're also going to have temporal summation. If we have lots of action potentials going to that muscle fiber in a very short period of time, that muscle will contract a little bit, then it'll contract a little bit more and contract a little bit more. We don't give it time to relax. We cause the thick and thin filaments within the sarcomere to overlap by an increasing amount. And then there's the length tension relationship. Um, with that length tension relationship, we need just a little bit of overlap within the thick and thin filaments of the muscle fibers. And if you have just a little bit of overlap, you can generate a lot of force. If your muscle fibers have lots of overlap, excuse me, if the thick and thin filaments have lots of overlap, the muscle doesn't have room to contract anymore and can't generate that much force. And on the other end of the spectrum, if there's almost no overlap, there's not going to be an opportunity for the myosin and actin to initiate the cross bridge cycle and start contractions. Um, this is one of the activities you worked through with PhysioX over the weekend. Um, I think a really good tangible example, and most of us have experienced this, is if you reach down and try to pick up your backpack, most of you can pick up your backpack no problem. I, I like to think so at least. But how many of you have ever had the backpack in the back seat of your car, you're sitting in the, the driver's seat and you try to reach way far behind you and pick up your backpack while it's in the back seat and you're sitting in the front seat? How easy is that? The reason it's so hard is twofold. First, you're using weaker muscle groups. Secondly, you've stretched out the muscles and you've minimized the amount of overlap between your thick and thin filaments and you generate less force in that position. And then finally, something else that's going to influence the strength of your muscles is fatigue. Well-rested muscles generate more force than worn out muscles. To become stronger or increase the strength of the contraction, you need resistance training. Um, how much resistance depends on the individual. You know, you get out of it what you put into it. As you increase resistance, you increase the gains in strength. So depending on where you are in life, maybe resistance training is going to the weight room and lifting weights. Maybe resistance training is stacking hay bales in a hay mow. Maybe it's gardening. Um, in a geriatric setting, and my wife primarily works in geriatric settings, for her patients, resistance training is standing up, walking to the toilet, and getting down on the toilet all by themselves. So it's, it's, a, it's a sliding kind of scale on what is resistance. You need something to push against you. And as long as you have some force against the muscle and you're contracting the muscle, that muscle is going to start to get stronger. Um, classic studies on resistance training have been done with astronauts who have been in low G or zero G environments for extended periods of time. And it's been well established that among astronauts, they have dramatic loss of skeletal muscle strength because of that low resistance environment. And they have to spend you know, lots of time exercising just to maintain or just to minimize the loss of bone density and skeletal muscle fiber strength. When we have resistance training, we synthesize more myofilaments, the actin and the myosin. And as you synthesize more myofilaments, you will generate more myofibrils. Generating more my myofibrils causes the muscle to swell, or the muscle cell to swell, and overall you have hypertrophy of the muscle fiber. If you have endurance training or anaerobic exercise, this is going to be, generally speaking, exercise that makes you breathe really hard for a long period of time, as a good rule of thumb. What we find is that this kind of exercise is going to focus on those fatigue-resistant muscles. It's going to primarily target slow twitch fibers and cause those slow twitch muscle fibers to increase their ability to generate 
ATP. So let's think of the key ingredients to make ATP. We need sugar, we need oxygen, and we need mitochondria. So as we go through endurance training, our slow twitch fibers are going to upregulate the amount of mitochondria present. They will upregulate the amount of glycogen stored in them. And glycogen is the way we store glucose in our body. It's the human or animal version of a complex carbohydrate. Plants stored as starch, we store it as glycogen. And then we're also going to have expansion of blood capillaries. When we think of those blood capillaries, those capillaries will deliver oxygen and allow for those muscle fibers to have increased supply of both sugar, oxygen, and to have an increased rate of waste removal. Something many students don't think about is when you're generating this ATP, there's the carbon dioxide as a waste product, there's going to be um, free radicals generated as a waste product. We need a way to get rid of these waste products, so we need to increase the rate of delivery and the rate of transfer by upregulating blood capillary perfusion. We we'll also find that as we have more endurance training, we have more red blood cells, or a higher concentration of red blood cells in our bodies. And there's ways we can manipulate this. A classic way to do that is for high performance athletes to go train in high altitudes. And by training in high altitudes, you decrease the amount of oxygen in your blood artificially, and you upregulate your red blood cell concentration. I'm gonna date myself with this reference here, but I think you're old enough that most of you heard of Lance Armstrong. Um, Lance Armstrong was a very successful bicyclist. He won the Tour de France many times. And it was found that Lance Armstrong um, was beating the system by doping his blood with a hormone that caused his red blood cell concentration to be artificially inflated. We'll talk more about that next semester when we get to the cardiovascular system. All of these endurance training activities are going to cause your cardiovascular and your respiratory systems to work well, but I can't understate this enough. I have a lot of students come into my office and say, hey, Mr. Durst, how can I do better on your tests? One of the ways you can do better, be a better student, is to take care of yourself. Endurance exercise improves nervous system function. If you have mild amounts of endurance exercise, and maybe this is like a 30 minute walk to class or to campus or from campus. Just getting outside a little bit will make your brain work better than never getting outside. There's also a lot of data that shows that in addition to improving your cognitive performance, there's improvements in overall well-being. Reduced rates of depression, increased rates of, or increased, I don't know, I don't want to say rates, but people generally feel better if they spend a little bit of time exercising every day. So, one of your homework assignments is to get outside a little bit every day. Not only will you feel better, but you'll be a better student. And on that note, who got outside this weekend? It was like the warmest day since October. It was amazing. Yeah, we're supposed to get another four inches of snow on Wednesday. Um, Let's talk about stretching out muscles. If you stretch out a skeletal muscle too much, that skeletal muscle is going to lose its strength. Um, when we look at smooth muscles, that smooth muscle cell, so you should write in the margins, this applies to smooth muscles. Stretching out smooth muscles is going to increase the rate of peristalsis. And I know this presentation is focusing overwhelmingly on skeletal muscle, but peristalsis is so important, I just had to leave it in. Um, it was covered in your textbook on this chapter. Peristalsis is going to be a rhythmic contraction of smooth muscle that moves food through the digestive tract. This is one of the reasons why you can drink something while you're upside down, why you can eat a sandwich while you're horizontal, and the food typically doesn't come back out your mouth, or the liquid doesn't come back out your mouth. Peristalsis of the smooth muscles of your digestive tract keeps it moving the same direction in most individuals. We also find that there's a stress response. If we have just a little bit of stretching occurring, that little tiny bit of stretching allows for the smooth muscle to relax. And this is depending on the smooth muscle. 
So lots of stretch stretching will cause peristalsis. Small amounts of stretching will allow for relaxation. You've probably experienced this before when you felt like you really had to go number one. You just had to go to the bathroom, but you couldn't. So you had to just hold it and hold it. And after 10 minutes, you didn't have to go anymore. Um, I'm potty training my kids right now, so that's a big part of my life right now. And as we look at this, it's that brief contraction and then relaxation of the smooth muscle. A little bit of stretching can trigger relaxation. Now, when we look at skeletal muscle fibers compared to smooth muscle fibers, there's totally different mechanisms of contraction. In skeletal muscle fibers, we have the sarcomere and the crossbridge cycle that's triggered when calcium and ATP are exposed to that sarcomere. If we stretch out the sarcomere too much, there will be no contraction of a skeletal muscle fiber. Smooth muscle fibers do not have any striations which means our smooth muscle fibers don't have any sarcomeres. There's a completely different mechanism, which we're not going to go into. We just don't have time. But what I want to emphasize to you is that you can always contract smooth muscle fibers, regardless of how much you stretch them out. You can still contract your smooth muscle fibers. And this is important because think of those times when you ate way too much food, maybe like a Thanksgiving meal or this time of year a Seder meal, when your stomach is greatly distended, you still need to be able to contract your stomach and push the food through the rest of your digestive tract. And if we could contract smooth muscle, we'd have a really big problem if we ate too much food. Something else that influences the degree of strength of our muscles is the plasticity of the muscle, how it responds to tension and stretch. Sometimes those organs or those muscles can stretch out in response to, excuse me, can contract when they're really stretched out. And then if you reduce tension on the muscles, it will contract a little bit as well. Um, for instance, if your stomach, as your stomach empties, the stomach gets smaller. It doesn't remain a giant empty sac that wiggles around. When you go to the bathroom, when you urinate, your urinary bladder physically gets smaller. It doesn't remain at its distended state. It contracts back again. Let's shift gears and focus on some disease application. One of the most common diseases of the skeletal, mu skeletal muscular system, or of skeletal muscles, is muscular dystrophy. Think back, I want to say to Monday of last week, we covered dystropin during class. Dystropin is a key protein that anchors the myofibrils to the sarcolemma that allows for the contraction of a sarcomere to be connected to the cell membrane of a muscle cell and consequently the endomesium, the perimesium, the epimesium, and the tendons. If we don't have that dystropin or dystropin isn't working appropriately, the disease is known as muscular dystrophy. And as the mu those muscles don't work correctly, we find that the muscle cells will die. And as those skeletal muscle cells die off, they're replaced with adipose tissue or just dense, regular connective tissue, scar tissues. The most common form of muscular dystrophy is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's a X chromosomal link disease. For those of you in genetics, you know that females are going to have two X chromosomes generally speaking, and males will generally speaking of one X and one Y. So if this is an X chromosomal linked disease and boys or males have one X chromosome, it's going to preferentially affect males. We find that what ends up happening is dystropin doesn't work correctly. And these individuals um, have a very unfortunate lifespan and quality of life. Can you imagine what your life would be like if all of the skeletal muscle cells in your body were malfunctioning and being replaced with fat and scar tissue. There's going to be a lot of malformations associated with that. These individuals very rarely live past the age of 20. Um, their skeletal muscles associated with breathing in and breathing out are usually the muscles that are going to dysfunction and lead to pulmonary or cardiac arrest. If they can't breathe appropriately, it's really hard to stay alive. 
Another form of muscular dystrophy is going to be facio-pomohumeral muscular dystrophy. Unlike Duchenne, which is a recessive form, this form of muscular dystrophy is an, a dominant form of muscular dystrophy. In other words, if you inherit one bad copy of the gene, you are going to manifest this phenotype or have these physical traits. Since this is an autosomal dominant one trait, this is going to affect both sexes or genders equally. Um, this is a figure from diseasepictures.com I included that shows classic sh um, phenotypes or morphology of muscular dystrophy. So I want to emphasize right here the triceps brachii. Those triceps brachii and other muscles of the body are going to have lots of scar tissue and adipose tissue build up in them. And as that scar tissue and adipose tissue builds up, the muscle physically looks larger. There's a lot of hypertrophy of the tissue. It builds up in volume. But because of the loss of skeletal muscle fibers, there's a decrease in function. There's a decrease in contractile strength. Another form of muscular dystrophy is limb girdle dystrophy. This limb girdle dystrophy is several diseases being combined, and it affects multiple parts of the body. The big take home with muscular dystrophy though, guys, gals, is that there's a, something, whatever the reason is, whatever the cause, dystropin is not working correctly and the contraction of a, a sarcomere cannot be linked to the contraction of a skeletal muscle or the whole muscle itself. And this is the last review question for muscle physiology. After this, we'll shift over to muscle gross anatomy. I believe we covered the answer to this question on Wednesday during class. It also was covered during your physio -ex exercise over the weekend. What is the minimum stimulus that we need to contract a skeletal muscle? What do we call it? Is it threshold, the latent period, the twitch, the motor unit, or the innervation? We're down to about 15 seconds. That minimum stimulus we need is known as the threshold stimulus. And all in all, I think we did a pretty good job. Let's talk about latent period because several of you answered latent period. The latent period is the period of time between when the muscle cell is electrically activated and to physically starts to contract. It takes time for the action potential to travel across the cell membrane and for calcium ions to get to the sarcomere. That period of time is known as the latent period and it's usually a millisecond or two or three. So that's it for muscle physiology. Let's shift gears. and go to muscle gross anatomy. So when we think of muscle gross anatomy, this presentation is not going to be as nitty gritty. It's going to focus on the big picture of muscles, primarily things that you can see with your naked eye. Um, for lecture recording purposes, 